Did you expect to be at Chelsea as quickly as you were there? No, not in the big picture. It was clearly because of my 13 years as a player there and the circumstances around Chelsea. I don't think you'd have a year at Derby and lose a playoff final and get the Chelsea job. The season before was difficult. Everybody knew that the, the transfer ban was coming. I was surprised when I got there where it was at in terms of feeling. It was clear to me that there had been a lot of mistakes made. Chelsea had a transfer ban, Everton had huge FFP which we're seeing now. So all those challenges I think have probably put me in better stead. What does the future look like for you? Well, um, England international, one of Chelsea's best ever. The golden generation's greatest midfielder, holding the record for most goals scored outside the box as a footballer, his record speaks for itself. But his career as player time manager is a knot of competing narratives. A Romford boy done good, a manager dealt a string of poor cards, or a player propelled by Premier League plutocracy. As always, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. My guest today is Frank Lampard. Frank, welcome to Unfiltered. Thank you very much. How are you? Really good. Pleased to be here. Very pleased to have you here. Um, how's tricks? What have you been up to? What's going on? Re really good. Um, obviously, haven't worked full time since uh, last summer. So for me, that's a good period of months where I've been at home with the family. So uh, my four children, two older daughters that just started uni and sixth form and uh, my younger children. And it's given me real breathing space to be a, a good dad. Uh, hands on great at home uh, a better husband because you know the job's so intense when you're in it so no I'm really enjoying that time so I do a lot of, of thinking uh, wanting to get back to work it's quite hard when you're out of a job there's nothing's conquered when something's not exactly in front of you you, you know you, you do a lot I watch a lot of games and preparing for the future and sometimes you've got to actually enjoy your time out of the game and um, I'm in a, pro, in a in a moment really where I'm, I'm happy at home in that way are you able to really concentrate almost concentrate on it or focus on it and, and stay in that moment because like you just said there right you're doing your your video you're watching that you're doing the analysis mm. and actually maybe it's a little bit of a blessing to be able to go no I'm actually going to take a step back nice holiday whatever it is mm -hmm. spend time with the family and just really try and focus on it because like you said once that next job comes mm. it's wall to wall yeah and it, it sort of goes back to my sort of playing career and how I was, I was brought up I guess because hard work was always the real sort of um, values of probably or Thing that were put into my head by my parents you need to work hard to be successful so i took that into my football career took that into my managerial career um but then there's a real time and i'm not sure exactly when the penny dropped for me but the recovery and um keeping your energy is as important as the hard work so you have to sort of work smart so i think that's a it's, it's almost a life lesson for me as i've gone into management it's much more intense than being a player so either when you're in the moment of working you have to find moments to keep your energy and uh, and not completely consume yourself but also when you're out of the game and my wife, Christine, is very good at telling me like, appreciate this, you know, re-energize, like be with the family. Don't watch every game every weekend. Don't go <laughs> over everything because it's going to be better for you when you do get back to work. And I, and I get that. And you try and find that balance. I think we probably all do that in our own ways. I've certainly learned a bit of that as I've gone along. So yeah, at the moment I, um, I do take the holiday. I do do the school run. I do spend time with the children. Um, and I'm pleased to be very present at the moment at home like that. Good for you, man. Mm -hmm. Really interesting thing you said in that management's more intense than playing mm. and I wouldn't have necessarily assumed that mm. tell me why because uh, it's like a real job <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's like a, you go from you know as a player um, you probably roll in at you know 9, 9.30 whatever the manager tells you you can get a bit early if you're a great professional you can leave a bit later but you're generally driving back home just after lunchtime um, physically you have to stay on top of yourself that's the beauty of when you finish you can actually go right I don't have the stresses of having to physically be at my peak as such so that's a nice thing but in terms of the, the practicalities of the job you have to be the first in you have to show in my opinion you have to be the one that's showing and setting the example by being that you're pretty much the last to leave every day because you have to manage people you have to manage the team the tactics the preparation the staff and the building all those things take a lot of time and as a, as a player you can be pretty selfish in a sense um and obviously you also get a lot more responsibility on your shoulders generally from the outside as a player you do but you can kind of you know you can take it yourself and go well okay well, i can deal with that when you're a manager there's many more variables that you can't quite control so i think you you can um those things are much of a more of a tougher challenge with the extra responsibility i guess that's the point right like there's a limit as a player to how much like dead ball set piece stuff you can do right you go mm. uh, even if you're hanging around after training for like four yeah. hours yeah. whereas you're a manager you go home you're still thinking about selection you're sure. still thinking about like all of that stuff it doesn't stop no it doesn't stop and that goes for anybody and that goes for somebody who's managing pep guardiola managing at the top of the premier league to somebody who's managing in league two maybe non-league i don't know because i think the job is so if you want to do it properly 
Now, people talk about overthinking. I'm a bit of an overthinker. I think you have to be if you're going to be a manager because if you're not, somebody else is maybe out there thinking, you know, more for trying to find a small percentage step forward um, in what you do. So, you know, you can take it. I mean, you definitely have to strike a life balance. Um, and I'm talking like this is like the most pressure job in the world. We know that there are many jobs out there that have, you know, similar pressures, even more pressures in different ways, life-changing pressures. But when you're in a job and you want to be the best at it, then you do find yourself having to sacrifice a lot, whether mm. you want to or not. That comes back to the family thing again of like if you're sacrificing that, sometimes you do have to weigh that up and um, and try and make sure you find a balance. So, but yeah, it's uh, that, that is the challenge. We'll get into the we'll get really into the weeds on the management side of things mm. over the course of this conversation. I want to start with you as a player, mm. and there's a moment a lot of people we f- will be familiar with. You're 18 years old, mm-hmm. West Ham fan forum. Mm. Harry Redknapp's there and a fan's giving out to him about you know he's let let a couple of other midfielders go mm. and he's promoting you into the squad yeah and Harry says Frank's going to go right to the very top yeah which without saying triffy little player is basically <laughs> the strongest <laughs> Redknapp endorsement that you can get yeah. first of all just tell me about that moment because I you know I've, I watched it before we started talking I rewatched it and I see you you're a, I was going to say you're a young man but you're basically a kid right yeah at that stage Tell me how it felt for you that moment. Uh, humiliating um, from the, from the fan uh, perspective. Who was standing up? He was actually the uncle of, a, of another player that was a year or two above me, um, who had got into the first team. Yeah, so he was. Um, uh, I don't need to mention the name, yeah, yeah, but fine. he was an uncle of a player, and um, he was obviously he was obviously put out that this boy hadn't made it, and I kind of got into the team. And that wasn't just him because it was a bit of a current theme amongst West Ham fans some West Ham fans um, of nepotism um, being promoted because Harry was manager, my dad was a coach. Um, and I understand that in simple terms. People kind of, you know, we're, we're quite cynical as British people at times, you know, <laughs> like we, we do look at the negative, possible negatives. Yeah. So looking back with maturity now, I understand it. But at the same time, as a young boy, sitting there with my chubby face and my curtains, I was a bit like humiliated and probably scared. I'm a bit like, you know, this was a grown man sort of questioning whether I had the rights. So I'm at the start of my career. I was desperate to be a football player. And I'm being, you know, publicly sort of shamed a little bit. And then at the same side, um, the support of Harry was incredible. And I, I appreciate that much more now because at the time I did appreciate it. But now I look back and think what that meant for him to say that. He put himself out on a, mm. on a bit of a limb. Um, thankfully, it came right. I'm not sure how much Harry absolutely believed it. And I'm not trying to make bad of what he said. Um, but it was a leap to say that because I had a long way to go to mm. get to the top. Um but I think it was probably a little bit of him. Harry is a person how he is. He defends his players as a manager and he defends his nephew as an uncle. And I respected that greatly and still do. And he's given me great help and advice and support all the way through my career. So that was just the start of it. But it's a nice, it kind of was it went viral a couple of years ago. It seemed to come out and everyone was saying, I've seen that video from mm. so-and-so years ago. And it was quite nice because it is a good story of my career um, that I probably was the kid that wasn't the, the Wayne Rooney that flew out onto the scene at 17 and Michael Owens and these ones. I had to work. I had barriers in my own way. I had some things that went in my favour. But it also, sort of looking back, showed that I, I had a few challenges there which I overcome. And um, that, that sometimes you can feel a big sense of pride of that, I guess. Absolutely. I didn't realise that it was like Battle of the Uncles with like Redknapp versus this guy. But yeah, I wonder what I taught you about, maybe this is a bit of a reach, but like masculinity, right? Because you've got someone who you looked up to, you know, mm. a positive role model in your life. And he's actually going out to bat for you, mm. you know, and not just going out to bat for you, actually like saying, not only is he worthy of his place now, he's going further than this. Yeah. How did that inform the way that you think about sort of male role models and and the example that you were setting at that moment in time? Well, I think, well, as you, as you grow older, as you say, and you start to view things in that way and you become a father as well and you understand those things. And there, there, are, there, there are many ways to sort of protect or to be a role model and to, um, maybe inspire and I think looking back as I say I didn't realize it at the time because I was probably stuck in my own world as that 17 year old there yeah just thinking oh, I want to do well so the, 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 I appreciate it obviously to support from my manager much better than him agreeing with him <laughs> yeah you're right mate. <laughs> <laughs> this boy is going nowhere yeah uh, that that was good um and now I look back and, and I really appreciate it. and now I'm you know I'm a manager have been a manager for the last four or five years I understand what that means would I support my young player yes especially if some um grown man was having a go at this sort of kid as I was so yeah but I mean it's this it is a it is a cutthroat world we can't be too soft about it and maybe in the modern world there is you know I think actually I think players now have even more challenges with with social media than than probably I even had that that smaller that minority whether it was a West Ham fans now 
these things are blowing up that young lads have really taken a lot um and you do there's a balance for me of what's acceptable and what you can use as a bit of inspiration for me i use that as a bit of i'm going to prove people wrong and then it can go over the line and i don't think i ever really see it. i don't want to be the one crying here many years later about it because my career went on it went on from mm. west ham it went into chelsea i had difficulties at england at times and i went through those and ended a lot earned a lot of caps and when you can look back you can kind of go yeah it's fine it's part of the journey and everything within the journey you have oh that was a dick that was a hit <laughs> there's another hit and you roll with them and mm -hmm. then you become stronger for it and anyone who's had a career like like i did or whatever 20 years playing professionally and now managing like you've got to get used to those things so that was probably my first real hit and thankfully i had um a manager, a man in Harry that was there to protect me in that moment and then go on to give me opportunities. Yeah, it's a really early stage for that to happen, right? 18 or whatever it is. Yeah. I'm interested, there's so much in what you just said that I want to unpack. Um, let's start with the kind of, the difference between the game then, the game now. And I think particularly this younger generation of players now, oh, no school like the old school, the game's changed, you know, game's gone or whatever. But what you're saying there right, about how hurtful, humiliating was the word you used to mm. describe what you had to say. Mm. They have that 24-7. Mm -hmm. They've got people in their DMs. They've got people on all mm -hmm. over social media, mm. not the nicest people in the world, saying mm. all sorts of things about them. Mm. And yes, obviously things are different now. There's a lot more, for example, sports psychology, recovery, all of that's different and developed. But other aspects of the game have changed as well. And that sort of pressure, we're going to keep revisiting, I'm sure, like mm. pressure throughout this interview. It's, I think it is, do I want to say worse? It's a different kind of thing now than than what even when you were sort of getting into the game. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's worse because what you've just explained is, is, is that that's a real heavy load. You know, this this constant social media that actually people, everybody's everybody a lot of young men and women are addicted to yeah. on their phones. I, I do too much more than I would like to. So they're 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 constantly exposed to this. Um, so I think that's that's one thing. Like some things have changed. I think we're much more aware of mental health. We're much more open to speaking about it. I remember in some of my days of playing for England, after getting knocked out of World Cups, we got absolute not just me. Like some players got absolutely, you know, given abuse for months. I remember David Beckham. We've all watched his documentary recently, talking about it. I had it in my own version, and other people had it. I think there's a better version of that now, slightly. But I think the big picture, I think you're right if you're saying that it's got harder for them because that's so accessible. And when you become a manager, um, as I have, you have to really have an understanding of that. When this player sits in front of you in the office and says, you're trying to find a reason why their form's not great or there's something about them that's the body language through the week's not kind of great, you can never jump to the conclusion as they would have done in the old days of, ah, something wrong with him. Mm. He's got a bad attitude or yeah, he's got a bad... Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? You actually have to dig a bit deeper and kind of go, okay, what are the pressures? Now, it's not, it's not always a simple answer. But I think communication as a, as, a, as a manager in the modern days is even more important because in, in the past days, it wasn't. The communication was bollocking after a bad game or you need to do this or whatever. Now it's more sort of getting to the point of what is behind this young player that might have an entourage, mm. that might have some difficulties, that might have a lot of things now that we're more aware of and trying to help. So I think that makes the management game much, possibly more tougher. But, yeah. but also it's your job. So you've got to try and get to the bottom of it. How have you mitigated the kind of, you mentioned, right, younger people being addicted to their phones. Not everyone, a lot of people yeah. are. If you're managing a dressing room, I don't know, after a game, people straight away yeah. over to the bag, you know, reading Twitter or whatever it is. Yeah. Have you thought about banning it? Like, how do you, how have you tried to manage that when you've been in a senior position? Yeah, it's interesting. It's very difficult to ban because it's such a cultural thing now that yeah. you, you're taking it away. It's like when you, when you work with a group, you want all the wins you can get. Now, you can't step over the line until it becomes ill-disciplined. But at the same time, that these players are very used to. And, you know, you can try if you try and make a blanket band, some players will go, if you're talking about pre-game, I have my music on, yeah. I'll do that. You know, so there might be one that's sending a message. You go, you shouldn't be sending a message to your mate at five to three. <laughs> but then there might be the other lad that's used. So it's very hard to do a blanket band. So you, you, have, you have to sort of deal in a little bit of like responsibility and hope that players are responsible and you know what kind of group you got and you can probably find a player that you think that's not quite right and maybe have a quiet word but you do have to be delicate with those things in the modern day and like the, the, the days of being a, a real hard taskmaster day day in day out with the in my opinion with the modern player are gone i think they're gone you, think? You, you, well, you have to you have to set down a culture so you have to have kind of rules that are there that may be unspoken but you set that what that is and expect them to be adhered to and if they don't get adhered to you speak to people and generally i think you have to speak one-on-one -on -one as opposed to this kind of, i'm going to sing you out in front of the group because i think that can be embarrassing i get that yeah and in the old days we were fine with it oh yeah that's what happens now less so but i think the days of being able to try and um 
uh, be, be an iron fist every day in every way is is very hard to to implement because the the football world now is so much high pressured. It's very hard. Certain clubs, unless you're the, the best of the best and the best squads and the best coaches that win every week, you're gonna you're gonna face difficulties. You're not only gonna lose in run of a couple of games or a game that you should have won. You do need everybody everybody positive and in the one direction. Yeah. So I think you've got to try and find all the wins you can along the way. That, 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 and again, that's not being soft. That's just being, I think, aware of how the world's changing because it is. Well, that's kind of it, isn't it? Like this idea that because you're not giving someone a bollocking in front of the whole dressing room that somehow like it's soft. Mm. It's not, this, not the same thing, is no. it? Like, you know, I look at, I don't, obviously I don't know Pep Guardiola, but I look at the way he manages players and the respect they have for him. I have absolutely no doubt that he pushes them in training. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Like sure. they are drilled. Mm. You can tell by the way they play. Absolutely. It would be ridiculous to suggest that he's a soft manager. And yet somehow I, people think that because you don't have that, I, I'm trying to find a better word for it than an old school, but I don't know if there is, mm. that like humiliation basically has to be a part of your man management. Yeah. They're not the same thing. No. And I, and I think it was easy, but it probably even the world moved so quickly. I went to Derby as manager, I don't know if it's four or five years ago now. And I think an easy mistake you could make from being in your first job as a manager, whether you've been a player or not, would be, yeah, you know, I remember the story of, you know, Alex Ferguson when he used to throw things around the dressing room and go, yeah. I'm going to be that person. You know, it, 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 firstly, you're trying to be some, someone else. And if you're trying to show your credentials to the group by showing how hard you can be in one person, I think you're going to lose the group pretty quickly in that yeah. way. So I, I don't think it's, you know, it's that smarter way, as I say, in this modern day when you're trying to get the best out of people. I think that, that is pr a pretty dated way. So again, there's a way they have to, players have to respect you. They have to understand what are the, what are sort of the non-negotiables that people love to say. But in terms of singling people out and trying to play that, that the hard coach, um, then I, I think that's... Uh, You'll be careful where you go with that, is mm -hmm. what I would say, and how you deliver it. And there's ways of delivering it. And I think there are ways that as a manager you can always improve because you get these problems a lot. They come in different form. You know, it can be a problem with a player at home, as I said, or maybe they are showing ill discipline and you have to deal with it in the right way because all you want is the best performance. Mm. You know, and if you can be a help to a player uh, and not just on the pitch, off the pitch, then I think you can. I, I, I still hold good relationships with a lot of players that I've coached particularly the younger ones who you feel you really have a part in their development you know and I speak to you know it might be a Mason Mount or a Reese James that you're meeting up with or chatting to and trying to give advice because you built a and you get a nice feeling of that mm. you put a little step part of their career and things like that and I suppose when people go why do you manage like you know all these pressures and you know that you get from the outside well you do get lots of moments where you can go no I'm actually part of something that's hopefully positive those guys still reach out to you then for a little bit of mentorship, a little bit of guidance. Yeah, they do, they do. And you know, you, it's you're you're managing a group of twenty five plus now, modern day squads. You can't keep them all happy. I, I, I think I read Jurgen Klopp say recently, like ten will love you, seven will think you're okay, and the other seven will dislike you. You know, it's a reality of management, and you can't be soft to that. It is what mm. it is, to a degree. Um, but I'm fortunate enough that yeah, the, the players that I work with. So this, there might be seven that don't like me. They won't. I, they're not messaging me and asking me too much. <laughs> but you know, there are some players. I say I'm lucky to work with some really you know good young players in my early days of management. Um, and you know, it takes a lot of care. You have to have really close relationships when you want to get the best out of them. I enjoy that side of it. I enjoy coaching on the pitch. They're, they're very young. Younger players now have been through modern academies and very used to kind of this constant engagement. How can you improve? Watch themselves back. Watch video. Us older boys, the old dog new tricks kind of one. But we didn't want to know. Like, don't talk to me. Don't make me rewatch a bad game. Yeah, yeah. Nowadays you can. So I do. I, I speak to the, the lads because I, I have also have a big interest in them. I want to see them go on and play for their countries. And Mason Mount moves moves to Manchester United. As much as you know, I have a real affiliation with Chelsea. I'm happy for him. I want him to go there and do well because mm -hmm. I was part of that journey. Reese James is. One of the best right backs in the world, in my opinion, absolutely in the world when he's fit, having a few issues. I, I'm happy to be there and go, how do you feel with what's going on and, and be that kind of um, person? It's a nice relationship. It's one of the big pluses. You feel a responsibility to do that? Well, I think so. I mean, when I say that, I'm not I'm not messaging them, you know, like, because I think they're probably <laughs> text me back. <laughs> yeah, you're my old boss. You know, you know what I mean? Like, stop messaging me. But if they, they know that I'm there, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So if they want to message me, I would absolutely be there for any player, really. Mm -hmm. Like, And he, even the ones that maybe don't like you, didn't work out, you didn't play them so much as you wanted to or whatever again you you move on and we're, all of us will move on in mm. some way i'll move on from a job they'll move on in their career for successes failures it'll all happen and the, the more mature you get with it i think you can become more balanced about it you know i've got a job to do but you, you want you want people that hopefully feel like they could you know you could bump into them to this in the street 
a few years later and they wouldn't go oh, i hated him yeah yeah, yeah. there might be a couple <laughs> but again that's the, that's the real world i wanted to um i said there was a lot in one of your previous answers i wanted to unpick you use the phrase nepotism hmm. which is a criticism that's been leveled at you a lot yeah and i wonder with hindsight maybe actually that 18 year old you sat there is probably a lot more vulnerable to that kind of criticism mm. than the player that goes on to have you know more than 100 england caps mm. well we can name all the other achievements you've had like it's a storied glorious career with the hindsight of going well actually i went and did it and there's a point at which you can get caught you know you can say it's nepotism you know name an england manager they're not picking me because we're not re related you know mm. whatever mm. how do you feel about it now looking at the hindsight and and particularly in relation to how you felt about it perhaps when you were a young boy um no yeah i feel completely different i think exactly as you've sort of put out the question there in that when i lived it at the time i hated it if i'm honest because you know it was my first hit of some criticism after i left west ham really which was kind of the end of me getting that form of nepotism because then i'd moved i'd removed myself from that situation in a way i probably had uh, a problem with it for a while when I used to go back to West Ham if I scored I would sort of glory in it a bit and those things you do when you're in your mid-20s you know um, and then I absolutely got over that to the point now where I see it as a part of my um, story that helped me become what I was because mm. I had something to fight against and we all do and it shouldn't be an easy road to yeah. get to the top in anything like it's not an easy road that's just what it is and there could be worse things that get put in front of you and i used it as a force of i want to prove people wrong so I, I don't have any problem with it i just kind of understand it now and understand probably the reasons behind it i think there was some probably some ignorance on the people that were saying it but there was obviously as well i wasn't a wayne rooney i didn't just splash them to the scene they probably looked at me and go he's not bad but i'm not sure how good he is mm. at that point so i'm unbalanced about it but it certainly use it as a bit of a false now for thinking that no, was just a good thing that i made me a stronger person and gave me something to, to to challenge myself with i really want to drill into that success side of it right because like i said earlier, you can list the stats i don't know take, take your pick the only midfielder to score more than 150 goals in the prem whatever you know more than 100 caps for england chelsea you know in the team of the decade all of this stuff right mm. You have had, you've hit the heights as a player. You've literally been at the top of the game. And I wonder, we've used the word pressure a couple of times, right? How much you're actually able to stop and go, fuck me, look at where I am. Look at what we've just done. Oh, we just won the Champions League. For, mm. Oh, we just won the, you know, all these titles. And you as an individual, as an elite athlete, being able to actually stop, like you were saying about your holidays, like you were saying about spending time mm. with the kids and go, this is amazing. Or are you next game? Next title, can't stop. I need to maintain my performance. Like, how is that? How have those two things kind of interacted for you? I'll tell you, the time I stopped would be the time I retired. <laughs> that stop was the it. time that I actually could go. And even then, even then, I appreciate appreciate my career. That sounds the wrong way to say it. I know what you mean. But I appreciate that the legacy stuff you're saying. You can reel off those numbers. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate it much more now. And go, yeah, I did score. You know, regularly season after season. When I was in it, absolutely not. I, I didn't, I read, uh, it was a while ago now, Andy, Andy Murray said something about never really enjoying his career because he's always thinking about it. And this would be quite common at elite sport because I think you have a certain mindset. Mine was pretty obsessive. I think you have to if you want to get to the top generally because if you have this talent, can you get pretty obsessive with the work to make it the best it can be? And then how do you sustain it and improve it and go against everyone else that's trying to knock you down and mm. stuff like that? And I was completely that person. It was very natural for me. I never, like, I, I could have a, a great season. I could score some so amount of goals, maybe player of the year at Chelsea or whatever, play player of the year for England or whatever, whatever it might be. And I would sit there at the end of the season and go, right, so what about next year if they bring in another midfielder? And what happens then? And will I, if I have some bad form, what will happen? Can I sustain what I did next year? And all that, and it was a daily effort for me. And it was, the good thing is, it was a, it was a, it was a power for me because my answer to it was training and preparation and i wasn't a saint i've said this before and different things when i've spoken i could go out and have a beer with the best of them after a win you know i, I can you know i had a good capacity to do that <laughs> but i would be in on the sunday and i would run around the back of the training ground and sweat it off that was something i grew up hearing bob stories of bobby moore he used to like put five layers on and jog around and like jog his beers off the next morning <laughs> now as the game was moving on at Chelsea you're playing three games a week you can't do it but yeah. at times I could do that but what I did other than those little moments was train and train and train and um, I obsessively did it so I'm a huge believer I've carried that into my management career now and I think players do have to be not reminded guided of of what you can get out of yourself and never to settle and I never settled so I, ne I never had them up I didn't really enjoy 
moments in my career like you would think you may do winning really the champ- yeah winning, winning champions league was an amazing night that's certainly the best night of my football and playing career but at the same time and that, that was probably one where i did kind of go yes because it had been such a long-standing thing for us at chelsea to win but all those things it was like how well did i play in the game you know, like we defended for 90 minutes. Could I have got up the pitch? I thought that Tony Cruz is going to be a good player because I've not really got near him today. You know, like, mm. and all those things, I was always analysing myself and going, you know, what what can I do better? And now I look back, as I say, I can have all the appreciation. No, actually, I, I was all right. But at the time, it was like, no, no, that, there's a new kid on the block, you know, or Steven Gerrard scored 20 goals this season. And I, you know what I mean? Like, I was competitive, ultra competitive like that. And so it, 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 being ultra competitive doesn't really isn't really a good balance for being enjoying the moment. Mm. Um, and I don't want to sound too negative on it because I can look back as I say now, but just, it's just a reality. I'm not saying, yeah, I, I obviously don't want to be like, Dan, yo, I've won the Prem, nightmare. It's not what I'm, <laughs> yeah, not yeah, what I'm yeah, suggesting, yeah. right? But it's, it's really interesting that the hindsight has allowed you to be more positive about it mm. and that actually, maybe at the time, it was a bit rough. Like you, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but kind mm. of like a little bit tortured about being at the top of the game, am I going to be able to stay here or what do I need to do to stay here? Yeah. It's pretty brutal. Yeah, it is. And again, it could be worse. You know, as you say, living a good life, you know, you're well paid for what you do, all these things you do win things. But at the same time, if that's what you are and then that's what I am, I'm, I'm probably fortunate, you know, it's the, the makeup of me as a person, how I am quite uh, obsessive. You know, I have to do things. I'm perfectionist, in fact. So you're never going to be perfect. So there's always something you're going to stress about to try and search yeah. for perfection. Uh, and now I don't have to. So my career, playing career is done. Now my pretty, you know, my managing career is the one that's the current and I always want to be better at that now. But in terms of my playing career, it's quite nice to sort of wrap it up. You get to the end and kind of go, yeah, let's just see how that career matures. Because when I look back now, I kind of go, yeah, I was scoring regularly from midfield. Mm. It, it's actually not easy to do. <laughs> and, do you know what I mean? But yeah. when I was doing it, I was working really hard to try and do it again and again. I would create sessions in my head and or train extra and when I'm in that side of the box when I'm outside the box when I'm inside can I finish one touch I was obsessive about that stuff um, and I actually grew to sort of love it in a weird way um, and now it's done I can actually just let that sit there and you probably probably do get more appreciation when you pack up to be fair mm. I think you do get people that come and say nice thing and I'm not just talking about Chelsea fans you know generally or when I travel and stuff like that because the, the world of football's exploded it's such yeah. a worldwide phenomenon now do you think that's something that's unique to you that kind of feeling of a little bit strange about the success. So there are other people that, I don't know, when you go to England, you talk about it, they'd be like, oh, I can't believe, you know, you got, did this this season, it's incredible. Mm. What's Is that something that's quite unique to you or do you think a lot of players sort of have similar feelings like that? I think some, I think some players will do. Yeah. I think it comes, I would think a lot of successful players, I don't want to talk for anyone else, but just my, my, my gauge of it is that there, there'll be people that will be a, a reason why you're a top elite sports person and some of those things are not that clear and some of those, the, the mental side of it, um, you know, you could, even you can perceive someone to be really, you know, laid back and carefree. They don't care. And inside, they're not really. There are a lot of things that you probably wrestle with. Yeah. And, and I think expectations are the thing because they, we all do have egos. Do you know what I mean? So I did want to be the, the best midfield player that every year if I could. I wasn't always, clearly. Um, but I always wanted to be that because you do get a form of adulation and as a human, we all like that. Yeah, you, like yeah, to, yeah. You, you do like to have that appreciation. So I think that a lot of players will have sort of different things that, that are part of their makeup, that were part of the reason why they're successful. And I think it's such, it's, it's that percent of people that can get to the top. You know, like I've got a, a, you know, children myself now. I'd love my children to be successful in whatever they're doing, get to that percent. But in football, you know, it's so hard to get there. And once you do finish the game and there is no things you're really striving for, you can't be better next year. And I, I packed up because I knew my body was telling me to pack up. Mm. There's a reason for that. And it was quite a nice feeling. I was lucky as a player in that sense. A lot of players pack up and you. And some of my friends, and they, they want to keep playing. They miss the player. I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done and you won't really see me in many charity games either because you know my waistband is going to get slightly bigger now and I want you to remember hopefully the 25 year old that was yeah, like up yeah, and down yeah. the pitch so that was a, that was, I'm pleased that I got there and finished in that way could you talk a bit more the word you use there ego hmm. could you talk a bit more about how that informed you as a player and who you are now because I think sometimes it's a bit of a dirty word certainly outside of a sporting environment people think of an ego and it's almost like a negative connotation right someone's like a bit arrogant or whatever hmm. but I, I really do think when you're t- it's such a competitive environment, when you're mm. operating at an elite level, you better believe you're the fucking best because otherwise, what are you doing there? Do mm. you know, like that confidence, I think, again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. 
But I feel like that must be a really integral part of operating at that level. It's a massive thing. And you know what? It's, it's possible to switch it on and off because when you say that can come across as uh, uh, arrogant, you don't have to be like that off the pitch. Yeah. So, you know, as, as long as you know that, and I think I think hopefully I was brought up well enough by my parents and it's, it's how I want to be polite, you know, off the pitch. So no one goes, oh, there's that arrogant, <laughs> you know, whatever. But you can then turn it off in the work environment, turn it on in the work environment where you become this person that wants to show, wants your ego, your, your ego to be out there because you want to have, in the dressing room as well, of 25 e other egos. If you mm. want to wilter a little bit, you can very quickly. The, the person who changed me in that sense and did, did more in my footballing career than anything than anyone else was Jose Mourinho. And people always go, what did he do with your position? Where did he move you? How did he tell you to that? He didn't tell me much at all. And I'm not belittling there. I think I was relatively good at my position and knew what he wanted from me and I just sort of did it. But what he did do was come in and kind of go, you, sh you should be this in your own head. You can be that. And he was the first person that I really reacted to and went, actually, yeah. And he obviously walked around a building like that. You know, he bowled <laughs> around with his slick look and was successful. And he changed my... So I became much more confident after that in what I was doing. Can you tell me more about that? It's re really interesting because I think Jose in particular has a bit of a reputation for, you know, eventually breaking players and all mm. the rest of it. But to hear you say he, he just sort of came in and almost made you believe or was able to help you psychologically talk about that process a little bit more it was it was quite simple as i say he did it in his own way so i was probably pretty impressionable and a few of, we were as a group we were quite young lads and we were all in 20 mid 20s and ready to win stuff so the timing was perfect and, and management timing is a big deal it's <laughs> not, not not 80 percent of everything but it's right up there you need the players you need everyone moving in the right direction but what he did he did that and he just said very simple things to me in terms of um how how not how good a player I was, but like he gave me the feeling, you know, you get a sense of someone who's your boss, you work with, they have complete faith in you. Mm. Um, and I think he probably saw that I was a hard trainer, I was pretty low maintenance, didn't give him any problems. So I just felt a real quick affiliation with him and it, and it just it just boosted me. And he, for me, like the year before he came, I think we'd probably my first year in the Champions League and I sort of done okay in the Champions League. So in my own head, I'm like, you know, as you said at the beginning, Romford boy, I'm like, I've done all right in the Champions League. He's got a couple of good goals here. So, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm doing all right. He kind of come in and was almost like, no, no, there's, there's a lot more to come. Mm. So and when someone sort of drags you along, I was, just saying pretty impressionable. I was like, okay, I, I better, I want to I wanna please my teacher. Do you know, it's yeah, one of those kind yeah. of things. So it was like that. It was it was uh, smart and it was very good. He would, he would deal with different people in different ways. And now I'm a manager, I understand it completely. A big portion of management is looking at all the individual. How do I get the most out of him? That that would take that. He needs some praise. He needs support. He needs maybe a bit of a crack of the whip now and again. Uh, and he was very good at that. Very smart. That's really interesting. I'd, I'd love to hear more. Actually, you've worked with some exceptional managers, right? Mm. As a as a player, and how that kind of informed your own style of management. When you were sat there in the dressing room as a player, were you thinking? God, that's really impressive what he's just done there. Or you'd be taking notes almost. Was it something that happened later? Mm. How much were you able to draw on those experiences that you had working with some of the greats? Yeah, um, I, I probably did it subconsciously in my 20s. It wasn't like a plan. Yeah. Um, and then probably when I got into my 30s and I started to consider more what I might want to do after playing, I would then really start to take things on board much more uh, as you mature, as you get older. And I think in, in, in my 20s, I would probably... I would have thought, I don't want to do that job. I have to control all of these lot. You know, they were like, especially at Chelsea, we had like a lot of alpha males in the dressing room. And, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, it was, it was I would have seen it that way. And then I got into my 30s, I know, no, I'm interested in this. And then you just, you do make mental notes. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I used to write things down all the time. I didn't. I made mental notes all the way through. And then as soon as I finished playing, I had a year sort of out, media work, but it was completely, it was nice to, to, to really gather my thoughts, mm. do my coaching badges. And then I got sort of, not thrown into the deep end, but when I did get a job, it happened really quickly. So as much as I've made all my mental notes for all those years, you're actually walking into a building and now you're the one on the other side of the meeting. Mm -hmm. You're the one picking the team. You're the one managing people that you never realize you even have to do as a manager, which is, you know, the 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 reception, the player liaison, the kit men, the this, the that. Everybody goes off you in the building. And I, I the, the thing I found, I really found, got interested in that. It didn't scare me. When I walked into Derby, it was like, you know, I'm wet behind the ears here. There's a lot I'm going to need to learn quickly, but I really appreciated it. I'm going to take this challenge on. We'll chat about Derby in a second, but I'm just thinking now, on the one hand, you get all these brilliant managers coming through the door at Chelsea, and that's obviously going to be a fantastic experience for you to inform your later managerial decisions. Mm -hmm. But there's also, there's something there about the kind of 
the patience of the modern game with a manager, right? You think about Ancelotti, right? Wins the double, gets sacked the next season. Mm. Jose doesn't even make it to a third year when mm. he's manager there. You have this high turnover. And if you're winning things, fine. Mm. Happy days. And, and I've, maybe that church, maybe we'll talk about Potter and Poch in a second, but maybe that patience hasn't been there for them. It's kind of, it's... The, what do you think about this sort of higher turnover, right? The the the, the shortening time span for, for managers in that sense. Because I know you look across the game, look at what like maybe, I don't know, Arteta or someone like that, who's been kind of trusted, mm. trust the process. Yeah. The patience to go through the tough periods and come out the other side of it. Well, it's changed, isn't it? And um, understandably, I think with the boom of the Premier League compared to when I was a young player, for instance, and would have been used to, you know, managers spending a lot of time at clubs now it's such a worldwide business, uh, profitable business, uh, with a different breed of owner, type of person, generally. You know, in the old days, it might have been, you know, the, the local man who owns a steel company that buys the club because they're a fan or whatever. And it, that brings a different sort of feel, maybe, to now what we have, which we all know. So it's just, I would just say it is kind of what it is now. There's a much more scrutiny. There's much more reaction, social media reaction, fan reaction, which can obviously escalate things quickly. If you're in a job, you lose a couple of games. Owners will be very aware of these things and maybe panic whether it might mean promotion, making the Champions League, getting rid of all these jeopardies. Um, and the manager probably takes the hit for it ahead of, of, ahead of um, anybody, in a sense. Do you think that's fair? Um, well, no, I, I think now when you look at it, you, the, the, for, for a manager to be successful, he's important. Of course he is. But everything has to be aligned. You know, you, you you only have to look at the teams that are successful now in the modern day and you look at them and you look at the ownership, you look at the sporting directors, you look at the recruitment, which is key, it's people that are going to win you things. And all these things have to be aligned with a bit of a plan to get to where you want to get to. So if you keep just coming down on the manager and the other things aren't aligned, you're going to keep coming back to the same problem. Mm. And I think Arteta is a great example of that because when you look at the, some of the tough times he had in the first two years or whatever it might have been, he was probably trying to find a formation. He was. I played against his teams. A bit back five, a back four, this one, that one. Like things that we all go through. You have to compromise a lot when you're trying to find solutions in those early. And then you lose some games, and then people start to trust, not trust the process. <laughs> um, and then that can gain legs. And of course, you know, Arteta is a fantastic coach. We're all seeing that now. But in those times, you know, if he'd have been maybe managing at Chelsea, he wouldn't have made through that period. And then he gets a chance to implement what he wants. Then he gets a chance to have windows where he's bringing in top class players and it all, you know, and, you know, he's moving in a really good direction in the club are. So I think you have to, it's, it's probably a good lesson there. But as I say, going back to the point, everything does need to be aligned. You have to have trust from your sporting director. The recruitment's got to be great. The ownership have also got to understand that some strengths have to be the people that are, you hire people to be good at things to go and do them well. And those are all part of the process. Mm. And then hopefully you get success. So there are a lot of things. And in the modern day, maybe a lot of clubs that maybe not quite aligned or it's not, you know, and then, then there are just those exterior pressures that we mentioned, fan unrest or things like that that can just make the job, you know, be very difficult to stay in for long. But I think the ma modern manager has to understand it. Um, I remember Walter Smith, who's obviously sadly passed away now, said to me when us young British managers, we have to understand that the world has changed. You're not going to manage for 10 years probably in a club you have to understand it for what it is maybe two year periods of what it is go in and give everything for those two years think about now think about what can i affect now and it's, it's an absolutely great point do you think that's for the betterment of the game though like if you know we were talking before we started rolling right about wayne rooney at birmingham city like 15 games you know that's that's not a lot of time no and it's almost i I've, is it making the game worse right this idea that people don't get the trust they don't get the time I don't know what the the if there are a broader consequences of that. Is it just part of it? We just got to deal with it. I don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm with you. I don't know because um, I don't think I don't think the product's going down as such in a yeah. general sense. You know, I mean, the Premier League is the best. You know, the, the the level of player we have is the best. The unfortunate nature for a manager is that you know if you don't get results, and you're working towards something, you could lose your job. You have to understand that when you go into it, as we were just saying. So I, I'm not sure it does really. I I, I do think you know a, a football manager. And I saw Jose Mourinho said this recently. He was like, it's the one job that everyone thinks they can do better. They can do better than you. You, you know, the bloke sitting in the pub thinks he can yeah, manage yeah. the team better than you. And I get it. I'm a fan too. <laughs> you know what I mean? We all look from afar. But when you've worked in management, um, you understand the, the, the 
all the, the the variables behind the scenes, what you're striving for, the team that you pick on the Saturday, because why didn't you pick him? Because he hasn't trained all week, or he yeah, yeah, tra- yeah. he's not training well, or this, or whatever. Because the opposition are doing this, we want to do that today. So all those things mean that the, the managerial job has never been more <laughs> scrutinised yeah, and, yeah. and viewed upon. And that's just a reality. You absolutely can't cry. I'm sitting here out of a job now, and I'm like, I'm really happy. I would love to work again. I want to find the right opportunity. Hopefully. That, that I feel like I get the best opportunity to do well. And you have to have that kind of balanced mindset. Otherwise, it's, the job's not for you. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. All right, let's talk about alignment. Let's talk about Derby. Mm-hmm. Um, your first season there, championship playoff, mm. some financial constraints as well. Talk, talk with it, particularly within the context of what you just said there, right, mm. about alignment and you coming in. How do those two things match together and, and what do they say to you about your time at Derby? Well, I, I had an amazing year at Derby. Personally, I loved it. Um, po- possibly my most enjoyable managerial year I would say and I'll, I'll probably try and explain why and, and I'll say that the excitement of my first job so that was good you know nervousness but excitement uh, talking about alignment it was having worked now at Chelsea and Everton which are huge football clubs um, it was very simple it was Mel Morris the owner and Mel Morris I'd heard stories about as I went in that he was a difficult owner you know had sacked a few managers and um, there were there were FFP issues you know all these things Um and I found him the opposite was my, um, how I, my, our relationship was. He was great for me. And so where, where we were aligned, we were, Mel, I came into Mel, we sat in the office on the first day, having agreed the job. So he got the team out on the board and said, right, there's the team and take him out, which was Vidra, who was a top scorer in the championship last year. <laughs> he got 28 goals. We'll take him out and we'll take um, Byman out, who was a quick winger, who's still playing in the championship now. And um, we'll take him out and put him there because we need to sell Vids and we need to sell Byman and we can get two million from Bristol for him. And I was like, okay. Now, I'm not I'm not acting completely naive to you. I understood they were in some problems, but the reality of the problems when you're actually the manager <laughs> looks a lot different. <laughs> Changes, yeah. Yeah, we've got 28 goals come out of the team. So he said, we can spend half the money that we bring in. We actually end up spending a bit more than that. But the alignment part was, my quick view on the team, having watched them when I, in the process of getting a job, was that you know the style they've been playing before was defense, not defensive, counter-attacking football. You know? And to, to a degree of success, they got to the playoffs and lost to, to Fulham in the... Um, in the semi-final whatever um, but my view was that the squad was old. it was the oldest squad in the league I think second in all the leagues in all, the second oldest which can be a positive experience but for me it lacks energy and I was coming in with this I want, I want to play a much more high intensity game I want to be able to press in the other half so Mel Morris was like great I haven't got much money for you but how are we going to do it <laughs> but the alignment factor was that he went I'd love you to go and use your you know, attachments to Chelsea and other clubs to get some those legs in there go, go and do it so I was like Mason Mount please um harry wilson on the phone and i managed to get these two kids in and then later just for the end of the window we needed a center back got to more fikayo tomori in and fikayo had had a, a loan at hull last year that hadn't gone that great but it was pacey it was quick he wanted to get up the pitch so again it's about alignment you need play if you want to be able to implement a style you need players that can help you do it and these young boys did come in aided by you know the experienced lads the richard keos the bradley johnsons the nugents that were really really good for me so it allowed us to sort of try and work towards a playing style, which was different to them, but I had, we had a lot of buy-in for it. Um, it. It got us up the pitch. We were pressing hard up the pitch. Um, we were playing pretty good football, 4-3-3, playing between lines, and we worked a lot on that. And, and for me, I was learning every day in terms of being a coach. How can I work unopposed work? These are our patterns. These are we want to play now. We're opposed. The, the competition and training was great. And it was a difficult season. The championship is, as you, as you know, as a Birmingham fan, <laughs> it's, a, it's a marathon and yep. some sticky moments when you go up and get beaten at Blackburn 2-0. It was still on my head that game. We got absolutely pulverised at Blackburn 2-0. Haunting you. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's there. I was like, we, we just couldn't, you know, it was a nightmare of a game. We had a couple of those. But we, we strung together a good performance. We, we beat Manchester United in the Carabao Cup. We went to Chelsea and lost 3-2 late in the game. Um, we, we beat Southampton in the FA Cup. Went to Brighton in the, I think the last sixteen in the FA Cup. So it was it was a lot of good things happening, um, and it was good. And again, it's a bit like I say about my playing crew. When you're in it, you don't never take pause for oh, this is going all right. You yeah, can, we've got them next week. Feels like a fight. That, yeah, um, but when I look back, I really enjoyed it. And the, the only um, disappointing fact is we got to Wembley and we lost to Aston Villa, and it was so disappointing because, as I said, how great Mel had been for me as a support. And the Derby fans have been amazing in terms of the city. I live, you know, in Derby. I loved it. I love being there. 
uh, and I wanted to get them over the line. Selfishly, yes, as a manager, but obviously for the club, it's a club of great history. Yeah. Um, and we come up against Villa, and unfortunately, Villa, we were you know underdogs on the day. Villa had you know Grealish, McGinn, Tyrone Mings, uh, Tammy up front, who'd scored thirty goals ish that season. But we we were you know absolutely competitive. Just lost the game two one, and a big disappointment in losing it. But it felt felt like a general success in terms of two things. At the time, I didn't really as I say take it in, but changing the style of play my first year I was pretty proud of that we went to Leeds and beat an amazing championship Leeds team yeah. they were brilliant they beaten us three times and then we went there and won it was a special night for me and probably as a coach it was a special day for me to go up against you know one of the one of the greatest modern day coaches you know in terms of idea he's a great coach and to win it was did a great deal for my confidence and then obviously we lost the final but then Chelsea came in and that changed everything mm. we'll get there in a moment mm. tell me about Bielsa, tell me, like, what is, what's he like? Because you, you, you hear these stories. I know it as a journalist, right? You think, oh, we want to try, we want to try and organise an interview. It's like, no, he doesn't do interviews. Mm. He just does press conferences mm. because he gives, he, because he thinks it's rightly, I guess, it's like the most equal way, right? That everyone has an opportunity. Everyone can throw him a question. He doesn't want to give anyone privileged access, <laughs> yeah. which is, I kind of actually respect it to be honest with you. He's, it seems so unique. I mean, what mm. was, what was he like with you? Uh, yeah, unique. It, it was like that. It was like that. We we played them at home. My second game, we lost. They beat us comfortably, and then he came in the office and it was fine. But it, you know, he didn't speak the, the language at all. It was a bit sort of different in terms of maybe what I'm used different to me. Like that's that's fine. I think you've got sometimes you've got to be a bit different to be a manager. <laughs> probably it's a strength. Um, but he no. In terms of going up against him, I had no problems with him. I respected his is it quirkiness or like yeah. the behaviour you say. Obviously, well thought out coach. Very, really intelligent in a football sense, although I couldn't speak English. And I was a bit like, surely you can speak English by now, if you're that intelligent, <laughs> but that was just me. But no, I, I had complete respect for him up, up until, as I say, beating them. Because for me, it, that was like a, a personal achievement. I was pleased. I was, we were nowhere near favourites and probably no one fancied us at all to get a result against Leeds, being 1-0 down going to Ellen Road. And we did. And I, and I was pleased with that. But I had respect for him. Even the Spygate stuff at the time when he... They sent someone to watch training and hidden in the bushes and it kind of all went off a little bit. That story ran away. So it was a, yeah, and it was an amazing press story. They loved it, didn't they? Do you know what I mean? And the fans are loving it and doing that at the game and they're asking me questions. And at the time I was a bit like, I'm going to say something about it. But really, I was a bit like, I wasn't that bothered. Do you know what I mean? It was a bit like I probably defended myself and defended the club as I saw it. And, and people were talking about it and going, you shouldn't have been talking about it so much. You asked a question. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah, and you go, yeah, like, I'm yeah. going to defend that. I'm not going to go, yeah, it's fine. Bring all your staff and watch our training. No, like, who does that? <laughs> that? That doesn't happen. All come down. It's a party. <laughs> yeah, do you know what I mean? No problem. We don't need to watch, watch yours, but you can yeah, come and watch yeah, ours. Yeah, like, yeah. That's not going to happen. <laughs> so I was, I was cool with it. Like, it was fine. Um, and it was just an experience. As a coach, I've got complete respect for him. You know, and As many great coaches do, he's a, definitely a front runner and a leader in yeah. terms of idea. And you've got to respect that. Tell me more about the recruitment side of it. And we'll get to Chelsea in a second. Mm. But like you mentioned there, right? You pick up the phone, you're talking to Mason. Is mm. it you as the manager, you're leading that? Like, let, let's just talk about him for, for the sake of argument. Tell me what that, what the process of securing that transfer was like. Well, M Mason was quite easy for me because I had the connection to him. I wasn't that personally close, but the Chelsea connection uh, had been a midfielder at Chelsea. He wanted to be a, a Chelsea midfielder. So I think about, but he was also sought after. And yeah. there were a lot of teams after him. And he's not an idiot. His agent's not an idiot. <laughs> you have to play the game and negotiate. Um, but I think we were a good home for Mason and he knew that and he could work with myself and the staff. Um, and so that was a relatively easy one. And, and in terms of the bigger question, in terms of Derby, where it was a smaller operation, it was actually easier in a sense because you get to the point quickly because of a bigger recruitment team, more data, more options, more agents involved more everything there as I say the beauty of it was you could get to the place is what we need and can, can we go and get it and we pretty much did and yeah as a manager you, there will be a point at, uh, where you will be making that conversation you have to sell yourself and the club to the player especially when they're sought after you really have to go to town and try and do it and um, I think that was probably one of my selling points of getting a job from Mel was mm. probably looks at him probably going freshly retired you know young players will sort of look up to him and kind of go yeah maybe I want to play for him and fortunately with those episodes with those young boys it, it, it went that way so tough result at Wembley did you expect to be at Chelsea as quickly as you were there um, no not in the big picture clearly I don't think you'd have a year at Derby um, and lose a player final and get the Chelsea job so it was it was clearly because of my 13 years as a player there um, and the circumstances around Chelsea 
So um, I could smell something coming. And when the, the season before was difficult, um, and it's strangely difficult actually, because Chelsea ended up winning the Europa, Europa League that year. Um, but everybody knew that the, the transfer ban was coming. Um, when their manager left, um, I was starting to be linked with them a bit. I wasn't hearing anything, but I was like, okay, that's interesting. I'm very happy at Derby at the time. Um, but it was Chelsea, like what that means to, to me. Um, but the, 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 the clear thing with it was Eden Hazard's going to Real Madrid. Everybody knew that. Mm. Um, as a transfer ban, Morata ended up leaving and going back to Spain or to Italy at the time, whatever it was. Um, and there was a ban. So I think, you know, my, my, the circumstances of me getting it that aligned were probably my, were definitely my history at Chelsea. And the fact that the usual Chelsea manager at the time who would be kind of walking into that role, the version of a Jose Mourinho or Carlo Ancelotti, looked at the job and went, transfer ban, no thanks. <laughs> Call me back next year when you can sign some players. Yep. Because managers want to bring in players. They want to get active. You want to implement a style. You go, oh, I'm bringing, we see it all the time. I'm going to come in and go, bang, bang, bang. There's yep. three players that are going to help me be more athletic, be this, be that, whatever. Um, so I, I think those things aligned, obviously. I got offered the job. And people still ask me, do you regret taking that job? No. Like, what what idiot would reject going back to Chelsea? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I don't care whether people go, oh, you know, there might have been expectations that I would never be able to get all those things. Like, and some people say to me that with a Derby job, but why didn't you go and start at the bottom? And I'm like, well, hang on. So Derby offered me a job. I'm going to go, no, thanks. I'm going to go three tiers down. Yeah. And work. You know, it's not that the Derby job had enough challenges for me. And I learned quickly. People want, you know, people want to stick to beat you with sometimes anyway, Always. question decisions. Always. But when Chelsea came, it was an absolute no-brainer for me. And by then I had confidence in myself. I didn't go in thinking, you know, I, w I wasn't walking in there, cock of the walk, yeah, I'm going to change. But I knew I could go and, and do a good job. I was confident off the back of my year at Derby to a degree. I knew the club inside out. And more importantly, I probably knew the academy and had a plan for how I wanted to be successful particularly in that first year and it'll be a challenge because people will all wait like now like Chelsea are 10th or 11th as we speak people still expect them to be in the top four yep reality is a different thing mm -hmm. and when I went back I knew I'd be expected from the outside to do that but I knew the reality was you've just lost 70% of your goal involvement from Eden Hazard the year before so what does that look like okay let's inject youth let's yeah. give these boys a chance let's try and blend the experienced players if there's some good players there already um, so I had a plan to my point We'll talk about more of that alignment as well because it's a really interesting theme coming through all this. But I, I want to pick up on that's really something really interesting you said about these kind of criticisms that you're getting. Oh, why didn't you start lower down? Or I don't know, why didn't you go abroad? Or what you know, whatever it is. And it kind of there's the one side of it which is yeah, but I've, I've been offered a you know a championship job, so why on earth would I say no? Thanks, I'll go. I'll go to League Two. Mm. I wonder from a personal perspective for you, and maybe there's a connection here to you know the sort of the ego that we were talking about earlier that's like you know you've you've played at the very highest level maybe that stops you from wanting to go down there i don't know is there something in you that kind of says no i, I don't want to do that or i'm not going to do that i i, I don't i'm kind of roaming around you i don't know what's no. the case with you but yeah no no what my, my point when i when i make that kind of line about the derby job is because that was what was put in front of me yeah. and if i'd have been put in front of me you know, south end united i don't know whatever I, I definitely have, when I say I had an ego, I had an ego as a player because I built up that ego and performed at a level and, you know, you want to get better and better. As a manager, you understand you start back at the front, of the, you know, the back of the queue, wherever yeah, it is, yeah, how yeah. you want to put that. So I would have been happy with any challenge. My point is that there's challenges at South End United as much as the challenge at Derby. It's a similar yeah, yeah, issue, yeah. you know, and, you know, like it would be like it's, we, we, we had these really casual um, conversations about managers, you know, this one about, you know, ex-players can't be great managers great players can't be great managers well I think you know, Pep Guardiola and Johan Cruyff and Carlo Ancelotti you know, will tell you differently do you know what I mean and Pep Guardiola should have taken the Barcelona job that he got offered yeah. as his first job I know he did like the B team first for a year and went straight into a, an amazing team with huge expectation though and he wore it because he's Pep Guardiola mm. he's amazing at what he does I'm not saying I'm that my, my, my version and my path is Derby gets put in front of you mm. yeah are you confident enough to take it yes was it a success? Yeah, I believe so. A failure in losing a final. Anyone can lose a final, in my opinion, with against the Villa team, as I said. But the year had been a success. So someone puts Chelsea in front of me. Do I want to take it? Yeah, because I'm my own person and yeah, I believe yeah. in myself to take it. So, you know, I probably had in my four or five years of management a lot more in there through the point of taking on challenging jobs. You know, mm. W was a challenge, FFP and all that. Every, every job's a challenge. I'm not trying to make myself... 
on a pedal stall that's just poor old me. Chelsea had a transfer ban. Everton had huge FFP, which we're seeing now. So all those challenges, I think, have probably put me in better stead than maybe taking the option, oh, I'll go and work down in League Two. Mm. It just wasn't my path. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, um, so, yeah. You've got, to back, you've got to back yourself. And it's really interesting, actually, because I think you're so right to say that about great players and great managers. Like, I, I wonder if there's almost something like uniquely English about it, right, in the way that... I don't want to keep talking about Birmingham City. It's not about me. And, you know, people immediately go, I don't think Wayne ever was really actually properly accepted by the Birmingham fans, mm. right? There's like almost like a chip on the shoulder that's like, oh, he's just in there because he's Wayne Rooney. Mm. And I don't think necessarily whether Pep Guardiola or Johan or any of these players had to do that. I wonder if there is something about England, the way we feel about the England first team and then those players becoming managers, whether there's something different about us that we think, no, earn your stripes, do the football pyramid. And, and we're uh, probably wrongly, right, having that that view, but... It's certainly an attitude, right, in the English game. I, I think so, and the, probably the way to break it will be for an English for English coaches to, you know, have the success. But you know, like I said, I've managed in the Champions League two years at Chelsea, and pretty good success. And Absolutely, people remember your ending, but you go. There was also the good stuff. You look at Eddie Howe. Now, I know Eddie's playing career wasn't maybe absolutely you know full of honours, which maybe was why he's such a great coach. He's gone into that early, and he's doing so well now. But. Eddie loses a few games recently and you still feel straight away the old, oh, they're going to go for that foreign option that's yeah, going to be yeah. maybe better. And I do, I do think there is an under, undercurrent of that. And you probably have to work against that a little bit and understand. But it's it's quite, again, I think it's quite dated because I think the, the era of managers before us, and I'm talking probably the Harry Redknapps, the Sam Allardyce, David Moyes is, is the current one, obviously, also got that sort of weird stick to beat them with that they're old school. And, you know, like, I mean, even I remember when, People like Steve Bruce again used to get going and getting promotions, and people questioned him doing well with Newcastle, but they questioned him and all these things. And and I think there is a little bit. Oh, they just think they can roll into the game. Now, I know when I coach, I'm a coach. I'm not a manager. I'm not standing over getting the coach and run around. I'll pick the team on Saturday. I'm there a week trying to make the team better, get mm. on the training ground, give the idea, all these things. And you get that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to be a coach to be that sort of manager on a coach. Uh, so nobody sees behind the scenes. No, nobody wants to. So they can be really, really quickly, people can just make an idea that becomes a perception. And maybe English coaches have that. But you can't be too brittle to it. I feel like now I'm already talking against it too much because it, if, if it's a thing, so what? Yeah. So someone on social media is going to go, oh yeah, great players don't make great managers. What, what do you know? With all due yeah. respect, see do you know later. what I mean? Yeah, so yeah. I, don't, I don't see that. Everyone has a different path. And maybe it's easier to... So like a manager that came from nowhere, you go, they must be doing something amazing because they were not really a great player, but now they're just a really smart manager. That doesn't always work either. So it's just each person in their own. Uh, but yeah, I think the England, uh, the golden generation one is probably something where they, people look at us and go, well, there were some negatives about you never won anything for England. So we might just have a little chop at you as well yeah. as, a, as a manager. Maybe. I did, I, yeah, we'll, we, we'll talk about that, the England bit a little bit at the end. But I, I, ne I never understood it with Bruce, by the way, when people like didn't rate him. I thought it was an absolutely brilliant Brilliant manager. Um, and a great bloke. Yeah, absolutely. Great bloke. Um, let's talk about that Chelsea and the Champions League then, right? Because I think it's like it's December. You're like, I think maybe second in the league. You beat Seville away mm. a month later. Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I mean, I it, it probably get to go back to the beginning with Chelsea. Please. When I got the job and it was, um, as I say, I wasn't probably, not first pick, as well, but it was a circumstance. And... I remember Marina, who was my boss, ringing me, and I was in my garden actually, sort of thrashing out the, taking the job, and negotiating a bit, and we agreed it, so it's done. Great, Chelsea manager. She went, listen, I know we've got some problems now. Just don't get relegated, and laughed. And I was like, yeah, I don't think I'm going to get relegated, but I'm, I'm quite happy with that being a starting point. Actually, I can, yeah, go, yeah, I can yeah. work with that. You know what I mean? So <laughs> something to aim for. I didn't think we would be near relegation, but you know, for her to say that to me, and I'd, I'd worked with Marina previously, so I know that she wants to win, and so does the big boss. Um, but that was kind of the, 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 how I went in. Um, so we worked away that first season. We got to the Champions League. We got to the we got to the FA Cup final. And, oh, it, was an, it was I was so devastated, disappointed to lose that because we'd beaten Liverpool in the quarters. We beat Manchester United at Wembley in the semis, and we were playing well. And got to Arsenal, and um, so it was a circumstance game. With, uh, uh, Aspia captain did pulled his hamstring. They scored. It was one or whatever. Um, Christian Pulisic went one on one, pulled his hamstrings, and with a miss, we got a red card, and the game went away. Fair play, it happens. But my, my point being, um, the season had felt a success. Again, in it, not feeling so yeah. much, you're just striving to try and win. Um, but players were developing, we had a, quite a good moment, and now, obviously, in that summer, we could go and bring in some players. So we did bring in some players, and I think players that were going to help the, the squad, Thiago Silvers, 
uh, Kai Havertz, Timo Werner, now Ben Chilwell. Some of those players have worked, some of them have moved on or whatever, to whatever degree. Um, but yeah, we got to December. I think we've, we were finding consistency. We'd, we'd won a lot of games. We were unbeaten for a lot of games on the trot. And when we played Seville away, we won 4-0 with what was a bit of a sort of second team because we'd already pretty much qualified through the group. It was one of the last games of the group. Um, we played brilliantly, beat them 4-0. And I thought, this, this group really can go and win something. But there's definitely was still a consistency issue. I knew and felt. Uh, maybe it was part of the reason that I've been a player in teams, you know, luckily because I had so many good players around, but we were consistent. We could churn out wins that would make it mean we would fight for the league every year. Coming second was disappointing for us. So I probably had that mindset and I knew we were searching for that. Um, and then when we got to December, we're second. So, you know, it felt like we were going in the right direction. And then we had a tough period. I think we lost uh, I think five in, in 10 or 11, but they were like some of the league games are like high profile. We got beaten by City, we got beaten by Arsenal and Boxing Day in close quarters. And uh, in a job like Chelsea, not just for me, by the way, we've seen it very well, that ramps up instantly for you. Yeah. And, and I probably, from that summer where I felt like we'd had a success, I'm not sure my boss, not Roman, but really felt it was a success. And I was like, well, you told me not to get relegated. And I've come fourth for in the Champions League. That, that is a success, isn't it? So mm. well, let's build on that. I wasn't sure. So I did have a feeling maybe that once things would get tough, that things could change. You know, that's, as you said earlier, the Chelsea job. And very quickly, um, you lose your job. So you go from probably looking back, I had 18 months as a manager where a lot had gone pretty well, not everything. I felt, um, looking back, I feel that actually. And then sort of a hard six weeks and I'd, and I'd left my job. And you get your first real kick in the teeth as a manager in the sense of you lose your job. Um, and the reality is we're all probably going to lose our job if you're going to stay in this game for a while. And, and it will hurt your pride a bit and it will hurt you because you'll have things that you thought, no, that was going right and I did right. And then you also reflect on things that you could have done better. That's, that's really normal. But I was disappointed. But, you know, and then obviously the team go on to win the Champions League and you end up with this sort of bittersweet part of it to a degree, got them in the Champions League had the young players that were sort of really relevant in the final, Reese James and Mason and Chile and all that stuff. Um, but it's not my team. Mm. So you, know, you end up like that. And um, yeah, that, that was it really. So it was an amazing experience. I don't look back on it with anything, but until that last month, as I say, you know, I left the club and stuff. Um, I don't look back on it. It was just, a, you know, the honour of managing the club that I played for so well and the good things that I do feel that came out of it in terms of young players that developed. And it's a shame now that I think the club hasn't moved on as in right now from, from where I think it probably could have done in different ways. Tell me about that emotion. You know, you said you hurt your pride. You know, you've experienced losses as a player. Mm. I think that's actually a really interesting contrast, right? Loss, defeat as a manager versus as a player. They say the same experience for you. Did you feel the same way about it? Was it worse because it was kind of, you know, you're worse as a manager. So the, the, the responsibility of everything is yours. You know, you have to go and do the press conference. 20 minutes later, so it's a play, you, you know, you get picked up occasionally or you don't. Um, you have to deal with it, you have to think, you know, how do I pull everyone back up? What's the strategy going forward? And it happens very quickly afterwards. So I think you take that responsibility on, so it certainly is. And when you lose your job, you know, the, the, the ruthless nature of what the world is, it's like you're working one day, you're told not to come in the next day. Like I never had that in my career yeah. as a thing. And I, I think you know, people who lose their jobs in real life, it's, it's not a nice thing. Um, and when it's public, you know, it's not just a quiet thing. You just yeah, chip yeah, on to your yeah. job, whether you're actually like breaking news and you're watching yourself all day, do you know what I mean? And it's like, that's what it is. But it's, again, you got you you do have to be grown up about it. You have to, you know, you have to respect it. That's just what it is. Um, and then you and then you reflect on it and you kind of go, yeah, did that well. Yeah, I, I know I did that well. Could I have done that better? Yeah, I think we would all come out of jobs with that kind of thing. You can't always directly affect the performance in a, in a moment, but could I have done that better? Maybe, yeah. And I came out of it like that. But um, yeah, it's just high, it's high level football. And for in, in quite young in my managerial life, I went into that job. As I say, I learned a load. I really enjoyed doing it. I think that the style that we created in that first year where we had those young boys coming through, I know that the Stamford Bridge crowd enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, watching it. It was kind of football that I wanted to be played. And at the end of that season, COVID came in and we went behind closed doors and we still got results and finished that season well. But I know that at that point, it felt good that I was trying to create something. And um, yeah, that, I suppose that's the beauty of management when you can feel you're in that moment of feeling pretty good about it. Yeah, for sure. Can you tell me a bit more? You mentioned about the situation at Chelsea now. I mean, you're probably the second best person to talk about what's going on at the club now. You have such a unique insight into the way it's being run. I, you know, Poch was getting it in the neck this weekend. I think that you could hear people like telling him to fuck off and stuff in the mm. crowd and all this. I mean, 
how do you see what's going on at the club right now? Tell me about you, in your previous answer. You mentioned just like the situation you left and kind of the direction that Chelsea have been in since. Could mm. you talk talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, I went back obviously for was it six, seven weeks at the end of last season. Yeah, and uh, not an easy decision for me in a way because I, I did understand that the club was in a difficult spot. But you know, it's my club, and I wanted to go back. I wanted to try and help. I wanted to try and get some results for my own self, of course, as well. Um, but what I walked into was a, a place where the players were. A lot, of, a lot of them had reasons to be upset or despondent. They were either leaving or wanting to leave. You know, uh, that, that can create a culture at a workplace that means excuses are readily available. Oh, you know, there's new ownership now and I'm not my, my age. They want me to leave. Some didn't really want to play at the back end of the season, if I'm brutally honest. And that for me was a real eye opener to um, where the club had sort of been and what you need to perform at the elite level, which is something moving in the same direction with a good culture, a good idea. And it wasn't it wasn't there. So when I left, and I said it quite a lot when I was there, and, I'm, and people sort of threw it back at me a bit. I was like, standards are not being good enough here. You have to have a level of standards to be a top club. Forget about the tactics of the layer on top. But things below have to be right to perform. And I didn't see it there. Now, I think in the summer, to be fair, they could players moved on, probably some rightfully so for them and for the club. Um, and new players came in. Um, so I think that probably would have f sort of freshened up the feel and pre-season for the new manager. Respect to Maurizio because he's you know known as a good manager, rightly so, he deserves respect. Um, but in my opinion, it was going to be a challenge again to keep moving forward quickly like people would expect. And that's proven the case. So I think you'll be very careful to point fingers at the manager himself or point fingers at maybe a young player that's trying to find form in a team that hasn't really got experience spying there that they can rely and look up to certain players you know the strategy has been to bring in young players so you've got young kids coming over at 21 from another country trying to fit into a team now i'm not saying in my day but in my day <laughs> when you bring in those younger players they sit their selves on the bench or they train alongside and watch how competitive training is and watch a drug burner how he trains and watch a john terry and what how he leads the club mm. and they learn and then, and then they get into the team. Well, they don't. And they, they don't come through at Chelsea. So we're to ask a lot of players to do that at the same time and develop, I think is not an easy not an easy thing. So I think you'd be very careful to. I think the strategy, of course, will be questioned. And I think there probably have been things done that you kind of look now and kind of go, could it have been different? Yes. Um, but it's getting it right now and changing it. But it'll be a process. The thing you said there about your, your comment about the standards at the club and it sort of coming back and getting picked up on. Can you talk a little bit more about the media and the kind of the pressure that comes as a result of it and I don't know maybe taking things slightly out of context getting a fair rap I mean how do you how do you view that relationship between yourself and and the media that's covering you because right they can also be a tool to your benefit as a manager right they're not just necessarily always something that's picking you apart and scrutinizing you yeah it's it's, a, it's an interesting part and I, I when I remember I've said this before I'll be very brief of it but when I spoke to Alex Ferguson and I asked him his three most important things as a manager go and tell me go on three things and it was a it was a uh, rec recruitment, uh, sleep, as in for yourself, um, and media, and I was quite surprised. I was like, "All right, okay." On definitely not recruitment. That didn't surprise me. You need good players. Sleep, yeah, I kind of got it. I wasn't sure it would be my top three, but when Sir Alex <laughs> says it, and you respect it, because um, he's saying keep your energy and media, as you say. So, I, I've always taken the view with media that you try and be as honest as you can. I don't like to, feel, to give the idea that I'm pulling the wool over fans' eyes off the back of a game, a, a defeat or whatever. Be honest. They want to hear that. So you try to do that. You try to have a respectful relationship with the media. Some will, some will piss you off because in the modern day as well, certain elements of the media are, are tactical geniuses. That sit there they sit there and think that they can and you know they'll after a game they'll put up a still image and go and this is where it went wrong you go well that's not even running so you can't even see who's pressing who's jumping you know what i mean it's yeah, easy yeah. anybody can do that as a you know as a to generalize a game or how it went so but you have to accept that because everybody watches monday night football now and those boys do it brilliantly so everybody else sort of <laughs> kind of gets on that one um, but you have to push that aside and remain focused on what you do because you can, you know, you could get up about it a little bit and be upset about it. And there'll be some media that don't want to give you credit. It'll be some that you're more friendly with because you've got a bit more of a respect over the years. Um, but the reality is, I think you try and treat them with respect. You do your job as well as you can. You don't get caught up in the in the bloke from the Daily Mail that's never liked you and never will like you and will always be critical of what you do and you focus on the job in hand. And that's what you try and do and handle it as well as you can because it's a it's an energy sapper 
re- relentless press conferences when you're a Chelsea manager and you're going Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday. They want you after the game, want you before the game, want you the, the two days before the game and all that mm. stuff. And you want to say the right thing and you want to set the right tone. It's really interesting to hear you say that. I'm thinking in the context, right? Your phone call into James O'Brien on LBC. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, is that a different Frank to the one who's sat here talking to me now? Talking no, no. To, no. Really? I, go on. Uh, no, it's not. I, I, I have uh, a button that you press and I can get kind of, uh, <laughs> I can react if I feel, and particularly if I feel like I'm defending myself or more so my family and um, what James O'Brien did, which is uh, for, for people watching who didn't know, it was years ago now, obviously, it was I'd, I'd split up from an ex-partner. I've got two children. Uh, I was trying to find the best way forward, which is, you know, we, a lot of people in life go through that. It's not easy on any side. My version of the side was I'm working in a high pressured environment. I'm going to work every day and ca- carry on doing that. Find the best solution at home. That means you're separating, but your kids are fine. And I was doing all yeah, of the right things. And he questioned it on live radio in the morning on the driving to train. And my sister called me and said, are you listening to that? I, don't, I didn't listen to it at the time. Um, listened to it for five minutes and got to the training ground and picked the phone up. And as soon as I said to the lady, yeah, can I speak to, you know, I want to join the debate. And she went, yeah, what's your name? I went, Frank Lampard. She went, here you go, straight, <laughs> straight through, you're on. And it was like, took two seconds. And the next minute, I've got James O'Brien. And, and I'm not brilliantly prepped other than I want to have a go here. Yeah. <laughs> I want to put it right. Which uh, I, as much as people go to me now, I get a lot of sort of people or cabbies that go, remember that phone call? That was brilliant. And I go, yeah, but it could have been better. Like, if, <laughs> I'd have given me, if I'd have sat more for 10 minutes. That's what we're like, saying about the tortured soul, man. It's yeah, like, no matter how good it is, it could always be better. <laughs> could always, so there you go. But I, um, so no, anyway, I, no, I fought my case because I, I felt that he was, you know, and, and it's all old news now. And um, yeah, big time. I don't agree with much he says for some reason. Anyway, that's another, that's another debate. <laughs> But I do think that um, no, I have a button that can that can be pressed, and uh, you know, as I say, I'll, I'll protect myself. I try not to. I remember my mum always used to say to me, "Rise above it." It was the best advice that I give that I probably ever got that sticks in my head. When all that's all around you is that, and life will throw you a James O'Brien. In my case, mm. uh, and you know, whatever, a, a losing your job, you have to try and rise above it. Not always easy. So I do have a button that sometimes jumps out and comes out on me. You've set out the stall at Derby. You've told me what it was like at Chelsea. Mm. In terms of alignment, what's the story at Everton? Well, um, I think it was quite publicly um, not very aligned <laughs> as such. Um, and I think I came into the club with a lot of difficulties. It was a really interesting year for me because I've been out of work for a year. I got offered the opportunity to go and interview for the Everton job. I never imagined myself managing Everton, and I don't mean that disrespectfully. The opposite. I, I grew up and they were a great team in the mid '80s. I was very aware of the history of the club. It was a huge club, a huge, great fan base. Um, but when I went for the interview, they were, you know, they had been struggling um, with the manager who left, and there was a lot of negativity. The fans didn't like the manager. It was clear. Do you know what I mean? So um, I went in there with a real football plan in the interview, and you know how I was wanted to play. Um, blah, 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 got the job. So I think there was a positive for me was getting a job because I walked into a really positive feeling from the fans. Um, some things work in your favour. Like I talk about things, timing and stuff like that. In terms of my relationship with the fans, it worked. And I and I forever, not with all Everton fans, maybe, you know, you, ne- you never get the absolute 100%, but were great for me in the process while I was there, even when I left and when I meet them now. So that I appreciated. But in terms of the actual club itself, um, I was surprised when I got there about how, uh, where it was at in terms of feeling and when I say that I think they've been like one win in 14 it's a typical situation where you may get a job mid-season it means that something's not quite right but the, um, the the feeling of doom the feeling of this club's going to go down for the first time for many many years is a real proud thing for Evertonians that they've, they've, been, they've not been relegated for such a long time and but but there was this feeling of but now maybe we will you know and when you have that as a something around your neck um that's engulfed the fans, probably engulfed the players, and there's a bit of a fear and all those things. It's a real challenge to overcome because that's like the first thing you better get right. You need to get some confidence back in the place. Yeah. And that's what I took on board straight away. I need to try and affect the confidence and come in and breathe some fresh air here. And we got we got a really good result in my first game. Then we went away and lost two games and you could feel straight away, oh, crisis, Phil. And we, we, it was challenging like that for a while. And I could feel that uh, tension from the ownership and the chairman, Bill came right, who's, who's sadly passed away, was fantastic for me as a support and a huge Evertonian, huge toffee, 
really wanted the right thing for the club. But it was clear to me that there had been a lot of um, mistakes made in recruitment. So we walked into it as an unbalanced squad. You know, there was a lot of players on long contracts and five centre backs, but not strong in this area, not strong in that area. And that this, so there were a lot of kind of bad feelings that were just around the place. Um, and we had to work quick time to try and stay in the league and try and change this feel. Uh, and, and we had like a bit of a ding moment as staff where uh, we're struggling a bit. We were trying to, you know, move forward, maybe try and change the way we play a little bit. Not to be, we're not going to go play ultra attacking football, but can we be a bit more progressive? Um, and we lost a game at Tottenham. I think we lost 4 0 on Sky. Um, and you got the usual reaction to mm -hmm. that. And uh, as staff, we all sat there next day and I went, right, we've got to change the, the angle of this. We have to re re be you know, more compact. We have to engage the fans in what Evertonians are pretty good at being like, okay, <laughs> we've got a cause here. We're going to actually get behind it. They were coming, yep. and follow they were coming to games early. They were doing all the great things. And we needed to play our part. But tactically, we needed to change and be really... So as a, as a coaching lesson for me, it was great. I've, I've been spent most of my managerial career, managerial career before that with line share possession, trying to play, play Chelsea players, you know, you have more yeah, ball, yeah, yeah. press high, athleticism in the team. Some of those things have been stripped away in terms of me, so I had to find a way around it. And credit to the whole club in the end, fans played a huge part, the players really dug in, you know, we changed the system, went to a back five, became much harder to beat, engaged Goodison um, and got over the line and it created probably one of the best nights alongside Munich was standing in the Premier League with Everton. It was incredible, the relief, it gave to those fans who run on the pitch, got fined for it, but who cares? Like, yeah. I, I didn't play it <laughs> in order day in a way, but like, you know, they run and it was an, a moment of huge elation. And, and I was fortunate enough to play a part in it and, and learn from it. And then, you know, probably to, to be quite brief in my Everton career, because we've spoken quite a lot, but I think I then knew that there's more difficulties coming because FFP was there. We knew that Richardson would leave. We could bring in some players, but like our net spend was not far off zero. And that generally means when you've struggled the year before that you're going to be in around there. You, you know, we couldn't really move forward. And I wanted to change the way we played. You know, Tarkowski came on a free, Connor Coney came on loan. Um, we brought in a couple of players. Um, but in that second season, as we tried to progress, the Dominic got injured just before the season. So we sort of played. Neil Malpai come in and struggled to to get in there. So we were sort of playing without an effective number nine. And this is not me making a lot of excuses because you will lose your job if you don't get results. Um, and in that last period of time, we couldn't get results, trying everything as a mm. coach, trying to find solutions. And we couldn't. And when I left the job, I was like, I, 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 you know, I got it. It wasn't like, I'd probably think more about Chelsea and go, there's some things there that I just think could have got over that and we would have moved forward with Everton. I, got, I understand and I know it's going to make a change. The problem for me is with Everton, now I have quite a big feeling for Everton because I, I really enjoyed being there for the year. And, you know, there's the similar problems that have mistakes maybe that have been made that are causing this are still kind of there. You know, I watched them play a lot. And again, if people can so easily comment on Sean Dyche or they haven't won in this many games, you know, it's not easy to turn it. A great club that is trying to sort of make up for, and that will be a process in my opinion again. So I look at sort of 2006 and it's kind of like that last hurrah of, like lad culture, the partying, the sort of the wags, all that kind of stuff that used to be like so central to the game back mm. then. It's actually a really strong contrast, I think, with Southgate's England now. I don't know how much of that's actually real and how much of that is just kind of like spin and marketing or yeah. whatever. But, you know, you see the pics of them in the pool with the inflatables and all the rest of it. And you think, oh, what a, what a lovely bunch of lads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some will be smart. Some will be smartly planted, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me about how that culture kind of interacted with the team at the time? Like the, that intersection of the kind of the more laddie place that Britain was in and, and how that connected to you guys as a team? I think, um, I don't think too much has changed. I think what you say there is right, that they've tried to change the perception of it and they've done a good job of doing that. Um, but you're right in terms of the environment was different. I think the, the, the wag thing was certainly a, a, a bad distraction um, that was could have been dealt with better looking back. Um, the media had their own place. They just lapped it up, didn't they? And it kind of took away from a group that were trying to prepare to try and win a tournament. It just became a bad distraction. Um, in terms of the lag culture, I think probably there's still a beer. If you broke down the England squad of the 26 players, there'll still be a couple of like a few more beers in the other one. Still goes yeah. to nightclub more than the other one. And it would have been like that with us. It was probably a bit more. As much as we have social media now and people get pictured, the news of the world would love to create that was there at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd love to create this thing of, you know, there's this going on. And I wouldn't say it was always the case. We were we were all good lads trying to do well for our country. Um, 
few things have changed now. I think the lads, because they probably can't go out. If they do, they get photoed. We saw the Rashford stuff recently. Yeah, yeah. Then they probably should be more careful. We're asking a lot. Young lads got to live his life, but um, so maybe they are more careful and, and live their life a bit differently. But the, the bigger thing for me is, it's, and I think you have to give Gareth a lot of credit for, I think you've got a very talented squad, but I don't want to belittle the job that he's done in changing the feel, changing the feel from the outside. He's very, very good with the media. He's seemingly very, very good with the players because you see this sort of reaction there as a family and a group that goes together and it looks like the club feel that we were striving for mm. back in our day more. It looks like they look very happy to be there. Performances look good off the back of it and that's probably what gives us our high hopes for this summer. I hope that Gareth wins it this year. I think he's uh, in, the, in the world of football and you talk about good people, good men, I absolutely see. And I've, I've met Gareth, I know Gareth a bit. He is exactly what you imagine he would be, in, the, in a good sense, I'm saying. He's a proper gentleman. I think he's done a really good job. And again, we go back to how people view and perception of managers. The minute Gareth may not win a game, he's not tactically good enough. Like, it's not, it's, it's a nonsense. nonsense yeah. It's an absolute nonsense. You know, It's a nonsense. A man that took us to the Euros, got to the final at Wembley, but beat Germany, played a back five, changed to a back four, all these things that just get kind of overlooked. And they go, oh, I should have done this in the final because he lost the game. You know, it's... So I think, uh, I've, I'm, I really hope that him and Steve Holland, who I've worked with before, and uh, the lads have a great tournament. This backstory, which you've, you've set out here, dealing with these adversities, dealing with these problems, taking, taking these challenges and getting results hmm. through them. What does the future look like for you? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Well, um, I don't know at a minute, and I think that's just, I don't want to sound like, oh, I've got no idea. It's when you manage it, when you're not working, in, in my you know, job at a minute, um, in my life, um, you don't know what the next opportunity is. You can watch every weekend and go, oh, they're not doing so well at the minute. Do you know what I mean? And you can sort of guess what might be. But I'm not I'm not precious. I want I want to work in a good environment. As I say, one of my favourite years was working at Derby. But I've also been at the other end where I'm working at Champions League. Chelsea must win games and you know, Everton must stay in the Premier League. So I've, I've, I feel like what you say is I've done a lot. So it would be what opportunity comes up? What does it look like? But certainly I'll probably view it more with what can, you know, what is seriously achievable and what's the expectations of the club it's one of my problems at Everton was I wanted to move the club forward and I worked with a fantastic sporting director who came in Kevin Thelwell and Denise who was my CEO and we were really coming to with what does this club want to be what does Everton look like you know a lot of, a lot of clubs do that or companies like what do we want to be and it was like we want to be this and we want to play attractive football we want to do this and I was like well we're gonna to have to recruit for that you mm. know? And what, so when's that gonna happen and, and you know and every, but everybody was understanding that it was going to take time but then the minute you lose a game or two crisis comes you go, must change everything so my, my point being I want to work with you know good people who go well, where do we want to get to and that doesn't mean my job's going to be like you say England we're going to win the World Cup or so and so we're going to go to the Champions League my job, next job might not be that I'm, yeah. I'm very um, you know balanced about that but I'm also very happy at home. I'm happy having that time out, thinking of football in a different way. I watch a lot of games, so I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing it through not the bubble of Everton trying to get results. I'm experiencing it through, what's Aston Villa doing this year? You know, I can mm. watch their games every, every week. I can watch Tottenham. What's Ange doing? What's he trying to... And, you know, things like that can tweak your own thoughts, being away from the game. And you look at training sessions and you go and watch, you know, people work. And I've watched a couple of coaches and I'm gonna, I've got more to come up. So hopefully I'll just be ready. I don't know what it I don't know what it holds, but I know I'll be a better manager myself through what I've done already. I just obviously will want to show that when it comes. We'll see what happens. Frank Lampard, it's been an absolute pleasure Thank having you. you in. Thank you so much nice for coming in. You. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Well, 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 well.